Today, we zoom right in onto a project that uh, hopefully I'll sort of go through with you how we uh, uh, use daylight and you maximize the opportunities and challenges, how the theme is for this, this time, to look at retrofitting a building, but what we're talking about is very much a building of the past in Athens and put it into a new space, but in existing city fabrics. Okay, just start. Yeah. So start with something, yesterday we have uh, a lot of talks about the political side, the economic side, and how that light has an impact on people. So today I just want to start with a couple of quotes um, from some great architects about how they see light in a more philosophical way. So just this one is beautiful buildings, it's some aesthetics if it's in darkness, if it's at night, there's no light there. So what light does is actually give it a life and actually give it a soul as well for the purpose of the building where the people actually in there and can use it. And when we look at daylight, we think about window and how we design windows. But really, what, what is it about? Is it really about aligning the window so that it, it looks proportional in a, in a facade? But really, when one designs windows, is to think about what is that window trying to do, is how it brings light into the space to give life to a space and uh, to make it function for people, for the well-being health of people, but also is how it connects to the outside to give a view so that there's something meaningful about the, the building being a certain place and how it's connected to the outside. So we all know daylight varies, and as a lighting designer, um, when we look at light fixtures, we know what to expect. You switch on the light, you know how much light comes out of it, and you know what the distribution is like. With daylights, it is not just about um, looking at how much light it gives, but also is how to capture the best quality of it, the variation of it. And uh, yesterday we have a talk about with a, with a chart looking at diversity against desirability. And one of the aspects why people like daylight so much is the variability of it. The change of color, the change of intensity, the change of way how the directionality of the light works on objects, on buildings, on people. Here's uh, just a, a range of um, images to show how daylight impacts on an external facade for building, how it sort of worked with the, the material itself to review the form of it, and how sometimes with the daylight, how you shape windows to create something more symbolic. Could be religious, could be other things. That's when you look at an image, you know straight away how you feel when you walk into a space. It's it captured on people's experience, it's sort of tapped into people's experience in feeling for that space, looking at pictures, because everybody has their own experience of daylight where they come from, different countries, have a different quality of life. So everybody have a very different takes on a space. It's not a number, but it is really experience. It's psychologically how one feels about light. There are many tools that we use when, as a designer, as a daylight designer, that we can analyze and know somehow what the impact is of light in the internal space. This, this issue of the magazine has a beautiful colorful cover, and it is actually a description, illustration of a, a annual illuminance across a space of what the distribution is like over the year. And numbers can be beautiful, and it has visualized the number itself, but it's, it's something that we can try to make sense of daylight, we can try to understand it scientifically, but I think the, the next step out of it is how to use it so that we can actually make it a real design, have a real impact for building, that people really, really like to use daylight and, uh, and it's useful for them for the well-being as well. So there we have a set of tools, we have a, a, a kind of intuitive instinct of how we want to use daylight, but how do we actually embrace this in, in a design, in a design process? So when we look at, um, I mean, this talk is about a museum, uh, the New Acropolis Museum is actually the first time I talk about this museum dedicated to it as one talk. In the past, I slip it in as part of the sustainability talk, but this time it's about the museum itself. So when we do a museum, first thing we, we find out is where is it going to be to work out what are the given um, weather condition of the space and the likely amount of daylight, how it performs and what the weather patterns are like. And the next thing is, what is that purpose of the museum? Is it just any building? 
It is something that has got a collection in there for visitors to, to view, but also experience of the cultural and historic side history of each of the artifacts, what is actually captured about the human presence. But then finally, what we also look at is the place, the context of the building. The context is not just about geographic location, but it is what the surroundings are, how it's now, from now on, need to connect to the outside, the, the existing neighborhood, the city context, what it means to, to the place itself. When I first arrived um, to study in England, I actually go to school very, very near to, to this place, Margate. At the time as a schoolgirl, I don't really make much of it, but it's just a place that's different from where I used to come from, Hong Kong. And, um, and through the working with uh, different um, museum projects, we come across painters, artists. A lot of them do paintings in the past that a lot to do with the, the experience they have on the skylight, the daylight. And apparently, according to them, they're all very different from different locations. They all, different locations have something special about it. And why they're different a lot is not just about the sky and the sun, it's also about the water in the area and how it sort of affects the, the atmosphere and create a very different feel of daylight in a space. We move across to the Netherlands size. And um, again, a lot of artists draw about rivers, waters, with, along with the sky, and how they look different. And also the interesting is the impacts written by the boys on the, the, a book called uh, the Holland's Lake, Dutch Light. It's, they talk about in the 50s how the change of the landscape, the water landscape, actually affect the sky. That's the, he reckons that uh, the painters can no longer do paintings in the old ways when they have a very, very different waterscape in the area. So where, where I come to now is um, the starting point for the Acropolis. Is when we as light designer, we talk about designing light, not just for one space, but it's a sequential space, and you move from one place to the other, it's how you experience the space. With daylight, it's exactly the same. When we look at daylight design for a building, we don't just look at focus on one room, but it's how people arrive to that room from the outside, and how they leave as well from inside to the outside. So it's a journey of light, and it's, it's this holistic understanding of designing daylight. It's just very simple, sim, similar to electric lighting, architectural lighting. We need to think about it quite holistically. Um, this is a, a, new, a new museum building that was built and opened in 2009. It started off as a, a competition in 2001, working with um, the architects uh, Bernard Schumi in uh, New York. Uh, the idea about the museum is it's got a given site. Uh, the, the mission about the whole project is to create a new museum space that house all the, all the remaining um, uh, architectural pieces that is, uh, has once been on the uh, Acropolis, in the Acropolis. So the site itself is in the middle of the historic site in Mariani. And excuse me, I've got some Greek nationals here that if I don't pronounce the, the Greeks in perfectly. Uh, so it's, it's right in the middle of a, a city center at the foot of the Acropolis. And um, being a building itself is not trying to be another big monument trying to impose on here we are, I've arrived. It is something that needs to be quite integrated into the existing um, city, the town. It's, an, it's, quite, it's a very built up area. And itself, Again, it's something that, because of the purpose or the mission, is, is, is need to reflect what it's doing. So just, just ban general background on the project, the overall floor area is uh, about 21,000 square meters, and uh, the actual exhibition space is about two-thirds of it. So it's designed into mainly sort of three layers. The bottom layers are mainly the excavation site, um, there's a huge amount of uh, archaeological excavations at the site itself. Um, so there's a, there was a plan to display those as they are and revealing uh, the hundred odd columns that used to be there to support the site. And on top, the second layer is um, mainly the archaic period uh, exhibitions. So it is uh, the whole museum basically display everything in the prehistoric time of the human presence in that local area, the Acropolis, to 
Uh, and then up through the, the Parthenon area, where the sort of main famous temples up on the top of the hill is, and then down to the more Roman period, but it's everything in the area. So this gives you a bit of um, orientation for the site. Uh, so we can see from the top of the hill is where the Parthenon um, is actually sitting. The, the, the new building was um, about a thousand feet southeast of it. So it's very important to have, have the building actually orientated so that it's got a relationship with the, the Parthenon itself. And it's done as a museum of flight. And why is it? Because primarily all the collections there are architectural pieces that used to be their sculptures, but they all used to be part of a decoration of the old building, the old monument building in Acropolis. It is not something that people just created, like sculptures these days just created, and this is something you create, and you walk around and look at it. It is sculptures, three-dimensional, it's got a back as well, but sometimes it's just sit in front of the facade, and that's part of the architecture. Over the years, a lot of things happen to them. They fell on the ground, different countries, people come and take some away. There's some sitting in the British Museum, some else were in the Louvre. So there's, there's, a, there's still a lot of remaining things there. Um, and these sculptures being created once for buildings in the past, now they become museum display. But the idea is when you go into the museum display, you still want to have it's surrounded with daylight because that's what they used to be, what they're created for. So now that's why we want to create a museum of daylight so that it is housed in an indoor space that people can admire the work and have the connection, learn about it in a very comfortable environment. But still, you want to present in the way how it was first created is the first instance. So this is an image of the main entrance. Um, the main entrance is actually pointing towards uh, the Parthenon Hill, the, the Acropolis Hill itself. And um, as you probably see better when it's dark, that you can actually see the, the, uh, the um, excavations, ruins, just in the basement. And, um, and the building floats about it. And the next layer, in the middle layer, is the arcade period. And the top is the, the Parthenon Gallery. This museum is interesting, is in a way that it doesn't really start with an arch architectural um, big vision of what this building should look like. It is, it's really come with, so with a, a box that needs to do what it needs to do and need to create the right kind of daylight environment for what's going to go inside. The building is very much designed inside out as well because uh, particularly with the Parthenon, the top gallery, the layout of it is, is completely trying to replicate what the Parthenon used to be. Location of the, the frieze, the metos, the pediment, etc. It was laid out mathematically correct and geometrically correct as well. And that leaves as a, a great opportunities to shape the daylight in a way that it's maximized that opportunities, but also is um, trying to capture the view and uh, to the locals that something called the Attican sky, something very special to them, is, is the opportunity to view the sky without having problem about glare, etc. So you can see that there's some interesting things happen on the, on the facade that you just wonder, why is it like that? Which I'll come to later. So this is a general plan of the space. Um, this is uh, the, the middle layer that I was talking about, uh, which made up, with, when you come up the core of the building, the first gallery you, you arrive is the arcade gallery, and, and then you've got other galleries around it as well. And then on the east and the west facade, still, ah, just about. So you can see these fins just now. And what they do is trying to make the eastern facade actually pointing north to create, to bring in the light from the north to come in to wash this space. And I can come back to it, why we try to do that as well later. And then at the top gallery, the Parthenon Gallery, this is, you can see the layout of it. That is, that's the main core for circulations. And then we have a series of friezes that's mounted around the core wall and meetups in the next layer. And like the Parthenon, where you have the sort of triangular pieces at the two ends, the east and west ends, is uh, relay, we're relaying out uh, the, the pediment itself, the sculpture. And then when you look back down, this is the roof light for the arcade gallery underneath it. For those who are ex daylight expert, this may mean something, so give you a bit of our orientation of how the building works around this section of it. And um, so this is the, the space 
that we've been de designing daylight, see how it can reveal the, the, um, the excavation very well during the daytime. And this is the cross section of the space. You see how it laid out from the, the bottom layer more of the um, excavation work to the archaic gallery, which is about 10 meters high, Caridis, Cariadis and the um, Parthenon. Now is the picture time. That sort of runs through very quickly now, having explained that. Um, so when you come in, you're, you're in, in, in the middle of Athens, very, very bright outside, probably more intense sun, and about even the winter time. You come in, and when we have the canopy walking through, first of all, the, first the people get conditioned to a buffering and as you prepare to walk in, indoor. And it's coming, immediate coming in, there's a big ramp that takes you right up to the next level, the middle level. But that is actually an opportunity that we created to, um, to prepare the eyes, that you actually go into much darker areas, so anything else you experience inside, you start feeling of daylight, doesn't need to be a lot, you feel that it's very much a daylight, so it's preparing the eyes for it. And then as you walk up, this is the big steps you see, and you can see the thin wall, how it's work, working, that is creating a daylight to wash it in a gentle way that you don't have a glare of looking the west facade directly, so it's a, it's a very nice light backdrop to present you the first set of pediments, not for the parliament, for another temple and buildings. And that's how it works when you look back out there. And there are displays that as you set into the thin wall, sort of coming through in. And you come round and turn around to this 10 meters high space. Again, making it very daylit. We could have ignored um, completely either the roof light or, or the facade. But we decided to work on a combination because I think yesterday was presented at uh, Florence Nightingale to say that light is not just being a painter, it's a sculpture as well. It's very, very important to make use of it, the best of it, to sculpt three-dimensional objects. And it's very important with daylight, we find ways to manipulate it so that it can just do that. A very distinguished way of doing it from day to night, different season or time of the day. On this, on this facade, we also did another trick about the view. It's right in the middle of the city. The, the building itself is very, very close to the locals. You can practically, if I don't have the, the diffused glass there, you can look out to someone else's bathroom. So it's, it just makes you have a sort of wrong connection being in that space. So we limit, we adjust the view in a way that we only allow for the, um, the transparency at the top level and then screen everything below so that when you're actually in the space, you're in a quiet, tranquil area that you can really start going back ages to, to really understand and uh, feel about these sculptures. But daylight needs to be um, percolated and managed, so we've got blinds in to, to soften the, um, the, the, the very bright sky at times. So it's the sky glare that needs to be dealt with. And the next slide is about the roof light, the roof light, how we dealt with it. It's something that's combined to think about holistically integrating the electric lighting with the daylight, how you can bring the soft light in, being a top, top light, to help not just flatten every sculpture by light from just the side, but add the down light as well to create this sort of uh, all round. It's nothing too complicated. It is just a simple diffused glass on top to make sure that you get a, a much more softer light. And at night, you have a very different feel that you don't have the diffuseness anymore, and the down lights uh, create a different drama. And then moving back to the ramp, and if you come up, if you remember there, there we, we bring in some uh, roof light through the glass floor, and uh, the reason why we're doing it is not just allow a bit of daylight so that people can see and don't use uh, electric lighting during the daytime, but there's another purpose, is for the daylight to actually be part of the theatrical um, lighting that we're trying to create for these karyatids, these goddess, who used to be standing outside, like that, six of them. Um, but there's a lot of interesting details that no one's seen in the past when they, because they're really right high up in the building. It's all these details about the, the way how they're braided, the hairs are braided. Working with the professor, um, Pandemalis, his, his, uh, it's a, it's, it was actually his lifetime ambition to create this building. It's how important to see the difference of how these goddesses have their, their hair braised because it actually tells you different period of how the sculptures work or the architects work over the years. So it's, it's important that we're trying to use daylight, not just about ambience, but it's to create a being part of the strategy because only with that, you don't need to add even more architectural lighting to create this sort of dramatic effect for lighting sculptures in a three-dimensional way. And then the top one, this is where you have the relationship, you have the connections with the Parthenon itself up on the hill. And it's very important as a designer, we need to understand the history of it. 
And what I didn't know before working on this project is actually a lot of this uh, stonework has color in the past. They was actually painted with colors, but over thousands of years, they're all gone. It's now just back to the marble. And um, so some of the thoughts about creating the geometry of these with uh, the rest of the, um, the space is to recreate the geometry, but also bring the friezes down at a level where the people can see up close. I think I have two more minutes. And this is just a number of options that I can come back to later. But again, for this space, it's, it's interesting that, yes, we have got a 360 degrees view of the entire of the Athens area, and then you can have the connections to the Acropolis Hill itself, and you've got sculptures that need to be lit. We can just, just let light come in on, on the four sides. But we actually make a, a bit more effort in sculpting it, the way of using daylight to grace sculptures that has got a very, very different um, aspect ratios. And uh, because they don't have all the algal marbles in place, so some of them they actually have to make up with uh, replicates, but they have to do it in a way that's very subtle, that you can just about to tell, and then when the light is working a certain way, you can tell the difference where, well, it's not just about the tone, but it's all the way how they sculpt and how you actually see all the, all the lines working. So there has been a lot of studies on looking at um, the way how different way of lighting the, the freezes, using daylight to light it, not using uh, spotlights to graze it, which we can do very well, but it's really truly using daylight to do the job that we want to light um, the sculpture itself and to balance the front light with something that grazes down. So it's creating more of the uh, modeling opportunities and use of frittings to sort of damp down um, the, the really bright sky glare. And, um, and that's the kind of space we created. But the nice thing is, during the day, it's really all daylit, not just light to see, but it's light to actually feel about the sculptures, how they, they were created once. And then at night, it is when it's really revealed with the electric light, and that's the time when you need the electric light to be switched on, and it reveals what's inside, like a jewel box. And that's how the relationship. So it's really using light to, to create a context and actually make it work, and making daylight actually work beyond just light levels. And uh, as Deborah said yesterday, it's about human energy efficiency. Thank you.